Uh, welcome to the fifth session of the third series of the PPCL ECHO program. My name is Christine Olivier. I'm a psychiatrist here in Lafayette, Louisiana. I work for Bloom Mental Wellness. Normally, you would be seeing Jody West for this portion of our presentation, but she is out today. She is our program coordinator, um, but I will be facilitating the full meeting today. Um, I wanna go over a few housekeeping items before we begin. So first, please enter your name, title, organization, and email address in the chat box for attendance. And thank you to those of you who have already done so. Next slide. There you go. That's This is our agenda for today. We do our best to stick to it pretty strictly. Um, after I complete the housekeeping announcements, I'll introduce you to your hub team. Um, and then Dr. Mayer will present the didactic, and then we will move on to our case presentation presented by Dr. Brown. And then after Dr. Brown presents, we will open the floor to clarifying questions and then recommendations. And we always encourage our community participants to join in first when we get to that portion of the presentation. So when we get to that, when we get to the portion of any, any questions and uh, recommendations, feel free to unmute your microphone and chime in, um, or you can enter in questions in the chat box and I'll do my best to, to screen those and uh, chime those in as needed. So let's go ahead and ask the hub team to introduce yourself. Again, I'm Dr. Olivier, a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and I'm gonna ask Dr. Queen to introduce herself. Hey guys, uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. I'm actually almost home from dropping off my kids at camp. Sad to say, I dropped them <laughs> off halfway through the camp, but at least I dropped them off. <laughs> uh, I'm a pediatrician and I work with Our Lady of the Lake Children's Health. I also practice obesity medicine and I practice uh, pediatrics in a rural pediatric location, Bogalusa. Um, and so I'm here as the pediatric voice to kind of support you guys as participants, but also to learn from you guys um, as well. So this is kind of a bi-directional learning mod model and I don't know everything. And so we're just here to support you guys and answer questions uh, for anything that you might. Thank you, Dr. Queen. How about Ashley Hutchins? Hi, my name is Ashley Hutchins. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner at Bloom Mental Wellness here in Lafayette, Louisiana. Thanks, Ashley. And then Lena. Hi, everybody. My name is Lena Reggett. Um, I'm now CSW, and I'm part of the Hub team and a member of the provider to provider consultation line. All right. Thank you. And these, we are your Hub team. So we are the experts on this call. So we will be helping to facilitate and answer questions and help clarify recommendations and that sort of thing. All right, uh, just before Dr. Mayer begins, uh, I just wanna tell y'all a little bit about the PPCL consultation line. As part of this program, and if you're registered fully for this program, this is a, this is a no cost provider to provider telephone consultation and education program. Um, you can call in if we address pediatric behavioral health concerns and also perinatal health concerns. Um, you can call in and um, if you need help with a case, you can get connected. Uh, we can take down the case and we can connect you directly to a, a, an expert that can help um, help answer questions and help uh, pull in resources and that sort of same thing. So I just wanna remind you about this uh, consultation line that's free to you and a great resource. All right, moving on to our didactic presentation for about the next 20 minutes, Dr. Megan Mayer is going to present on pediatric bipolar disorder, which for us is one of the most difficult diagnoses in child and adolescent psychiatry. So Dr. Mayer, please take it away. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I see some familiar faces and um, I'm pleased to have been uh, invited to the PPCL um, echo to, to present uh, for this month. Um, as Dr. Olivier said, this is a really challenging um, diagnosis to make. Um, so that's why I figured I would present on it. I think that it's something that I regularly miss. I think that statistically more of my kids than I see um, have bipolar disorder than I am diagnosing. So I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I work at LSU in New Orleans and am mostly um, in outpatient settings. So as mentioned, uh, bipolar disorder is very difficult to diagnose in youth. So it can present in a variety of different ways. 
there's significant overlap between the symptoms of hypomania or mania and um, other comorbidities like ADHD or disruptive behavior disorders. And then seeing kids within their developmental context is important uh, and obviously changes over time and can change the way in which uh, their symptoms present. And then understandably, children have a hard time verbalizing their emotions. So it makes sense that an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 15-year-old would have a difficult time um, or could have a difficult time expressing how they're feeling. So back in the 1990s, there was this big boom of bipolar diagnoses. Uh, so it um, over the course of two decades, the, the diagnosis in kids was made 40-fold increase. So um, there was just kids coming in and out of the hospital and lots of pe people making the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Not only, I guess the big concern about that is not just the, the diagnoses, but that this was being treated with um, second generation antipsychotics, which have significant side effects. And so um, when the DSM-5 got together, um, they talked about a, a different category that could explain a lot of this irritability um, that was seen in younger kids that were being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So that diagnosis was DMDD or disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And what the studies have actually shown is that those that kids are diagnosed with that are diagnosed with DMDD are much more likely to go on to have anxiety and unipolar depression in adulthood. So, so again, challenges in diagnosis. So how strict are you with the terms of hypomania and mania when looking at kids versus adults? Is this kid that's coming into your office really happy and goofy and silly, or is this uh, pathological in some way? Um, and then is this behavior within the norm for their age group, or is this uh, atypical in some way? Another challenge is that care is often sought during the depressive episode, so it can be hard to get a really good history of um, cyclical episodes of elevated mood outside of this um, depressive episode that they often present in. And I don't know about you guys, a lot of the folks that I see are very poor historians. So just gathering the information of the current episode can be a challenge, much less trying to get a really solid uh, narrative of the longitudinal picture. Um, so we really kind of have to see these kids multiple times over time to feel pretty confident about the diagnosis. So, so the core symptoms of hypomania or mania are mood and change in activity and energy levels. Uh, notably, the the kids uh, notice can notice a change in energy, um, and they're much more able to identify and verbalize that than specifically a change in mood. So that's a more sensitive question, and it needs to be a change in behavior and function outside of their uh, of their normal baseline. So if they are a twelve year old who has ADHD and is hyperactive and um, bouncing around all the time. Um, we need to really establish uh, a change in this um, to feel comfortable with our diagnosis. And then hypomania versus mania is really about the degree of impairment. Um, it's listed as four days and then seven days. Um, the hypomania being people can still kind of function and then mania often leading to hospitalization. But from what I read, the majority of hypomanic episodes actually last for two days. So this is just the DSM criteria. I won't read through it all. So you can move to the next, you can just move to the next slide. Thank you. So as mentioned, uh, the majority of um, bipolar kids uh, present during a depressive phase. So in children, it can be tough to make the diagnosis because they may not necessarily look depressed all the time. They can look like themselves. They can look like they're able to enjoy activities. Um, there's fewer changes in sleep, appetite, energy, um, they may still enjoy some activities, but then not enjoy some activities as they used to, sports or extracurriculars. And then hallucinations and delusions are not very common, but hallucinations a little more common. I think it's about 25% uh, or less. And then in teens, we see more of an atypical depression picture. So that's sleeping all the time, um, increase in appetite, craving carbs, gaining weight, increased psychomotor retardation, 
Um, but really notably, there's a higher risk of suicide in a bipolar depression than there is in a unipolar depression. And there's also higher rates of self-injurious behavior. So what are the risks for bipolarity when somebody comes into your office during a depressive episode? So by far the, the high or the, the most sensitive is a family history of bipolar disorder, an earlier age of onset, having already experienced multiple depressive episodes that haven't responded well to antidepressants, and then medication-induced hypo or mania. So mixed episodes, uh, so di uh, bipolar disorder in general is, is a challenge to diagnose, but in mixed episodes can be, can even cloud the picture a little bit more. So you have some of those um, elements of elevated mood, impulsivity, high energy combined with um, the mood, um, combined with some of the symptoms of depression. So it kind of, it, it creates a little bit of a restless irritability picture and there's a higher risk of suicide um, in these pictures just because they have the high energy, the impulsivity with kind of the hopelessness irritability, which can lead to um, kids or adults really taking action. So uh, very difficult to, to recognize and diagnose. So subtypes, um, there's subtypes just as there are in adults, bipolar one, two, cyclothymia, which I think is pretty rarely diagnosed. It's kind of just sub-threshold hypomania with depressive episodes over a year. Um, the majority of youth when they're first given a diagnosis are given um, kind of this bipolar unspecified diagnosis, but the research kind of shows that within two to five years, they usually kind of fall into either the bipolar one or the bipolar two category as they're seen longitudinally and um, symptoms kind of fall more into place or criteria, I guess you should say. Um, so younger samples tend to show more manic symptoms. Teen teenage samples tend to show more depression. And then I was very, really surprised, or maybe not surprised, I don't know, that the average, uh, it's an average of 10 years to receive a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and begin treatment. So that's a really, really long time. So epidemiology, um, so the prevalence rate is just under 2%. This is seen globally. Um, similar rates in males and females. Um, diagnosis numbers for bipolar one uh, are the same or are similar in youth and adults. Um, the rates of bipolar disorder increase or presentations increase after puberty. Um, adults that have bipolar disorder, more than 60% of them look back and can recognize episodes before they were 20 uh, years, old, years old, and then um, some even before the age of 10. So one notable piece is that frequently uh, bipolar disorder is preceded by disruptive behavior disorders like ODD or conduct symptoms and anxiety. And then notably the, the earlier the onset, often more times the severe, the course of illness and the poor the outcomes. So comorbidities, uh, again, this is kind of part of what makes it very challenging to, to sort out the symptoms of bipolar disorder. So the studies uh, for kids on bipolar disorder are very heterogeneous. Um, they use different criteria, some are strict, some aren't. Um, so when you look at all the, um, the data that they have acquired, the ADHD is uh, highly prevalent, but ranges from 15 to 98%. But this, so as the manic symptoms are more common in kids, um, these kind of uh, impulsivity, uh, energized symptoms are often can be uh, confused with ADHD. But notably, uh, ADHD uh, is seen and identified before bipolar disorder would present. Um, and then certainly have um, some disruptive behavior disorders, anxiety, and substance use. Okay, so looking at genetics, um, so the single best predictor of uh, having bipolar disorder is a family history. Um, so the rates of um, transmitting bipolar disorder from a parent to one parent to a child is uh, 10 to 25% and then higher if both parents have bipolar disorder. But even the, the rates of depression within that family would be higher than bipolar disorder, if that makes sense. As with uh, most things that we've learned in medicine, there's significant 
significant interplay between genetics and the environment, uh, the different stressors that can alter the expression of genes, and some of those things that we can see would be physical sexual abuse, negative parenting styles, poor social support, and prenatal alcohol use. The differential looks somewhat like the list of comorbidities, so ADHD, especially in the, the child onset, anxiety, schizophrenia. So if you see a teen that comes in very depressed uh, with psychosis, it could be difficult to suss out the symptoms that would look um, more mood disorder and more thought disorder. And then diagnoses with um, disruptive behavior and poor emotion regulation. So another one of the challenges is, is looking at the kid and uh, seeing them within their developmental context. So having a good idea of what um, the what a normal kid that age, the normative behaviors look like, and then um, so then being able to identify that something is uh, atypical. So in younger kids, um, latency age kids, we'll see some magical thinking, unusual beliefs, non-scientific explanations. And then teens have this uh, kind of low grade grandiosity of, of being indestructible and kind of nothing can, can take me down and um, I'm invincible. So how do they present? So it's varied as said, the majority of them present during a depressed episode. Notably, if the kids are asking to, to go to see a provider, they are more concerned about depressive symptoms, but if a teacher or a parent is more concerned in seeking a referral, it's often for disruptive behaviors and irritability. So if someone, if a kid does come into your office um, and the symptoms are not depressive, but more hypomanic or manic, they're usually sub subsyndromal and the most common symptoms to prevent present would be um, increased energy, mood lability, and irritability. Uh, hallucinations can be present, and then grandiosity and hypersexuality can be uh, more difficult um, to identify, but they are the most specific of the different criteria. I'm sure all of you guys working with kids see all the time the sleep disruption with uh, kids that are well and not having problems, especially since it's summer, everybody's up all night playing games and then sleeping during the day. But two thirds of kids with bipolar dis disorder have a decreased need for sleep. And what's notable about that is that they're sleeping less, but they're maintaining high energy and not needing to sleep as much. Uh, understandably, if kids are irritable um, and not sleeping and impulsive and making poor decisions, there's going to be a lot of conflict with uh, friends uh, as well as family. There's certainly increased risk-taking behavior that can be um, high on impulsivity, risky sexual behavior, um, greater thrill-seeking, and then there's significantly higher uh, rates of substance use in teens. And whether that's self-medication for the moods that are going up and down, or that's kind of part of the impulsivity piece of kind of sensation seeking is, isn't quite understood. So poor prognostic factors, uh, we've already talked about some of them, but earlier age of onset, not taking medicines as prescribed, a lower socioeconomic status, psychosis, comorbid anxiety, and then rapid cycling which is defined as more than four or four or more mood episodes in one year. So treatment, I did wanna to touch base on this. The majority of the talk, I want it to be about the challenges of diagnosis because I think that's where a lot of us uh, get stuck. So there's very few studies um, looking at younger kids in treatment for bipolar disorder. And there's very few studies about treating bipolar depression uh, in context with their comorbidities. And then important to know is that there's a very high, there, there's a higher relapse rate in kids and teens than adults. So even if they're um, adherent with the medicines, engaged in therapy, 80% of kids will have a relapse of a depressive episode or elevated episode uh, in a two to five year period. Uh, so psychoeducation, I think is a great place to start with the majority of things that we see in psychiatry, 
um, oftentimes what I'll do is it's usually after I've seen a kid or a teenager um, for four or five times, maybe we've tried a medicine and it's not worked or they seem like they've gotten really better. And then I realize that the really better isn't necessarily that they're doing great. It's that they're a little bit on the upside. Um, and what I'll say is, I think that you have bipolar disorder. These are the reasons why I want the kid and then the caregivers to go home and read about it. And then at the next visit, they obviously they're the experts on themselves. And so then they can come back and say, yes, I think that everything that was described is pretty consistent with me or mm, it doesn't really fit. And that's hopeful too. So talking about the symptoms, the course of treatment, the various medicines and therapies, and then um, kind of preparing them for that this is uh, gonna be a long-term illness. Um, and then again, just hitting on that sleep hygiene. So if they're not sleeping just because it's summer and they're playing video games, that's going to increase the risk of having uh, an elevated episode. So treatment uh, for acute mania or mixed episodes, it's in general monotherapy. So starting with lithium, Depakote, or one of the second generation antipsychotics. The data can be a little bit different. Um, some say that lithium is uh, the best medicine to start. And there's a lot of um, proponents of saying, you know, don't try lithium five or 10 years in after they've uh, you know, had multiple episodes and hospitalizations, but try it really early on or maybe first. Um, so the FDA has actually approved lithium for kids 12 and older in bipolar disorder. And there's some evidence to show that they have better long-term outcomes, more euthymic days and less suicidality. Um, but I think oftentimes it's underused just because of the myriad of um, possible side effects and uh, kind of the, the blood monitoring that has to happen. Um, but some studies say that for the mixed and the manic episodes, that second generation antipsychotics are more effective. Um, but certainly I think that we're all aware of the metabolic effects that can come along with those. So if people don't respond to that monotherapy, kind of the next step would be if you need to increase or optimize the dose, if there's an antidepressant on board that you need to remove, change the medicine or add a different medicine with a different mechanism of action. So the treatment for bipolar depression, there's very few studies. Um, there is olanzapine and fluoxetine combo and then um, Latuda or lorazidin that's been improved. Pretty much all the other medicines, if you use in bipolar depression, it's just data um, extracted from uh, adult studies. Did want to mention antidepressants. So in taking an SSRI or SNRI, that can trigger an episode of hypomania, um, particularly when it's used by itself. Um, but one thing that can be a little tricky is that up to 10% of youth treated with one of these medicines may become disinhibited. And the disinhibition uh, is different than um, a hypomanic or a manic episode in that uh, it would resolve in a day or two after stopping the medicine. And then certainly folks are aware of the, the black box warning of um, age 24 and, and below with increased intensity of suicidal thoughts. Uh, so in terms of treatment, when somebody has a number of comorbidities, uh, it's there's poor studies, but pretty much it says address the mood symptoms first and then go on to look at stimulants for ADHD or adding um, an SSRI, SNRI for anxiety disorders, but maybe trying therapy first. Uh, I won't go into all of these, but um, all of these medicines have different side effects uh, that need to be considered and discussed with, um, with families. In terms of uh, longer term treatment, um, so kind of the acute phase can really last up to six to 12 months and you're continuing the medicines that initially worked. Um, if you are have a, a subsequent episode, um, then that kind of phase can um, extend really even to two years. And for the maintenance treatment, um, lithium and Depakote have been shown to um, be the most pre prevent most likely to prevent future episodes. And as highlighted before, 80% of kids are gonna have a recurrence in two to five years, even if they're taking the medicines and um, adhering to treatment. Uh, sorry, that's just a repeat of that slide. 
So I certainly don't want to forget that um, as in most of psychiatric diagnoses, therapy is really essential. Um, there have been trials to show that therapy uh, for kids with bipolar disorder increases the rate of treatment adherence or medication adherence. Um, there's a number of different treatment modalities that have been studied. Um, a number of them uh, use the family, which makes sense if you have a 12 or 15 year old with bipolar disorder, you're gonna need caregivers um, and various people involved. So in sum, uh, there is sufficient evidence for pediatric bipolar disorder. It's very challenging to diagnose. And I think even the experts miss it regularly, or at least I'm obviously trying to get better. Um, you know, I think that seeing kids over uh, a long period of time increases the um, likelihood that the diagnosis is uh, correct. As I said, I've seen kids that, um, you know, by the fourth or fifth time, I have a much, much better idea after seeing them a number of times and really gathering a pretty good history. Um, the bipolar disorder in kids does have severe consequences, including significant substance use and suicide. But in terms of treatment for medications, there needs to be a lot more high quality studies uh, over time. So I think I covered hopefully a lot of uh, info within my 20 minutes. You did great, Dr. Mayer. This is great information. Thank you so much. And we're going to roll right into the case presentation for time's sake. And so just so you know, thank you everyone for those recommendations and contributions. You know, these will be typed up and sent to you by email in addition to the follow-up uh, evaluation. So we encourage you to complete the evaluation to get credit for your continuing education credits. But thank you for everyone for participating in this session today. Um, just some last minute wrap up things. Um, if you haven't done so already, please make sure to enter your name, title, organization, and email address in the chat box for attendance. Um, if you would like to receive those CEUs, you will need to complete the post-session survey within 48 hours, and that'll be emailed to you. Um, and they also will put the link in the chat for the CEUs. You can click on the link uh, to get to that survey as well. Our next session will be held on Tuesday, July 9th from 12 to 1 p.m., and if you have any questions before then, please feel free to reach out to us at ppcl at la.gov. And you can also, don't forget about the, the consultation line to call if you have any difficult cases and need some help with. Also, please consider submitting a case to Bye. present at one of our upcoming sessions. Um, we will send the case presentation form and the sign up link in our follow up email as well. And thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for presenting. We really appreciate that. That's a very difficult case. I appreciate the work you did on that case. Thank you for the recommendations. Absolutely. And good luck with the rest of your residency. Thank you.